Hello, I'm Jackie Schertz. Welcome to Hey Listen. Today's topic is the Gallaudet protest one year later. The Gallaudet protest was the civil rights movement for the deaf people in America. And I'm going to quote Jesse Jackson. He said that the problem is not that deaf people cannot hear. The problem is that the hearing world will not listen. We have two guests with us today. We're very honored to have them. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hey Listen. Today's topic is the Gallaudet protest one year later. We're very fortunate to have two guests to, with us today. Fred Weiner, who is uh, he's a special assistant to the executive director of the National Association of the Deaf, NAD. He's also one of the people that was involved behind the scenes during the protest time. Also we have Greg Liebach. He's the president of the student body government in Gallaudet University. You'll graduate next year, correct? Yes. I'd like to start with your most positive experience during that week of the Deaf President Now movement. What, what is the most impressionable memory you have? Perhaps I'll start. I think the coalition of people that really came together is what had the most impact on me. That coalition where no one really stood out in the crowd. It was the entire group working together. And it was really inspiring for me that everyone could come together like that, that everyone shared the same goal and the same view. Deaf and hearing people working together that's what really inspired me the most. The unity was really strong during that week. Another thing that I learned from that week also was that we, we made a, a great complaint, but we needed to be reasonable. And we found that through that, the world responded to us and supported us, that our complaint was appropriate, and that we were justified. And after that, after we realized that, it helped us to have more confidence in our feelings and ideas. You mean before deaf people didn't know that other people had similar thoughts? At that time, it was the first time that we felt that bond? Not only that, but the public as well. You know, that we had a grievance, but in addition to that, it wasn't that we were complaining too much and that we were being told we were wrong. When we made our complaint and stated our views, we found support, and after that, we found the spirit and the cooperation to achieve other things. Yes, in other words, deaf people had tended to wonder, were we on the right track? Were we really <coughs> behaving appropriately? 
would the hearing community support us and think we were right in our actions? So it was important for us to make sure we were handling the situation appropriately. And we noticed that indeed we were. If you uh, went through this movement again, what would you do differently? Fred? I think I'd do it all the same way. Uh, really, nothing in my hindsight could be changed. I mean, there were a few little uh, things that could have been a little bit smoother, but really, I'd keep everything the same. I'd agree with him. Because really, our long-range goals for that week, I mean, certainly we had a lot of short-term goals and a few glitches, but our long-term goals were really met, and things fell together for us. I think maybe a, a few less hours of meetings and maybe uh, raise some money, you know, raise more money, making sure we could support the protest during the week, and maybe a little more planning where we had a clearer idea what had happened short term for the next day. You were talking about raising money. During the week of the protest, a lot of people donated money, like $40,000, and now 21000 is left of that fund, of those funds. What do you plan to do with that? Well, we've thought of some different projects, and uh, we've also enlisted some suggestions from people in the community. Most folks have said that the money really belongs to the students and the student body, uh, that perhaps we should focus on action. taking some action, you know, overnight. Uh, one idea was that the students could set up a scholarship fund and use the interest we raise from the money to support two students for perhaps leadership training or perhaps set up uh, an internship working with the government, a political internship. Uh, we've thought of setting up workshops to work on leadership skills or perhaps fund some students to travel around the country and give presentations to spread some knowledge that way. Uh, we want to see Gallaudet University have a leadership fund to help train future leaders. You were talking about setting up a monument, possibly, um, to commemorate the Deaf President Now movement. What do you think about that at this point? I support the idea of having a monument, but I don't agree with the idea of using the money that we raised during that week to do that. I think we should ask for different donations for that purpose. The leftover money that we have should be used mm -hmm. to continue the movement. Yeah. We should help other students and not allow the spirit of the movement to die. And we should find other funds for the purpose of a monument. The Deaf President Now movement, the one week, there was one week before, prior to that, and uh, did people think about wanting a Deaf President before that? What did people think one week and one year before now? Well. Perhaps Fred can approach that from a community perspective, but I think from the student's perspective, really, uh, there was a great difference between a year prior in, say, 87, uh, compared to what we were feeling in 1988. And I think we weren't really thinking of a deaf president at that time. Uh, we had President Lee, who was at Gallaudet, and we were hoping that he would stay in that position as president right on through the 90s, perhaps. Then when he resigned in the fall of 87, uh, really, there wasn't that much discussion among the student leaders at that time. We'd started to have some discussion, and a few of the students, underclassmen who weren't really involved in leadership activities, started some discussions, and as we started to discuss that, more and more, I think it evolved. The idea evolved that we'd like to see a deaf president. But there wasn't that much prior planning about it. And Fred? From the, from the community point of view, I have to admit that the community itself really were not thinking that it was a necessity to have a deaf president. One month before Lee resigned, we were thinking about David Birnbaum, who was one of the people who was active in the movement, we were having a chat, and uh, he said, Lee resigned. Lee's thinking of resigning. And I said, well, I sure hope that they find a deaf person to be the president of Gallaudet during my lifetime. 
I mean, that was sort of the way we looked at, the, at this. We thought it was a system that was so entrenched that there'd be, you know, you just sort of hoped that sometime during your lifetime they would get a deaf president into Gallaudet. And as we approached it, some people, you know, weren't really supportive of it. They weren't willing to sign petitions, but <laughs> after a while, everybody wanted to be involved with it, and it really became the event. Yes, indeed. <laughs> if Dr. Zinzer, um, if she hadn't been chosen, if she, if she had known sign language, would she be, still be a Gallaudet this, today? I don't think really it would have made a difference. Uh, you know that there were three finalists in the process and two were deaf individuals and they were qualified deaf individuals. So seeing that, I think the feeling still would have been they should have selected one of those qualified deaf individuals. I'm not sure sign language was totally the issue in whether she could sign. And people came out in support of that concept of having a deaf president. And I think that, that was key, having two qualified finalists. Then when it was announced that Zinzer had been selected uh, that evening, I think we got a lot more angry and a lot more involved. In fact, some people said that there was a misquote in that announcement. Uh, yes, I was there at that time, and they said that deaf people weren't capable of doing it. And, you know, there were people there who witnessed it. It was said uh, the interpreter wasn't, that was there didn't want to uh, answer that question because of the interpreter's code of ethics. They felt it wasn't their place. But we were there and we witnessed it. As the dark secret that interpreter is holding. <laughs> what are your thoughts about this, Fred? If uh, Zinzer could sign, do you think it would make a difference? I have to differ from what Greg said. From the deaf community's perspective, some people thought immediately, just get rid of Zinzer, period. Some people thought, well, if the person has a deaf background in deafness, that might be acceptable. And to the public's eye, they may have gotten support for that. Mm -hmm. But from the first day that the protest really hit on Monday, and the reporters are asking us a lot of questions, and we got copies of Zinzer's resume, I don't know how they got it. They got it from somewhere, and it, it appeared and it did not have the word deaf in her resume. Not one mention of that word. No experience working with deaf people. And this is the second time that she'd applied for this job. The first time, they had picked someone else. And you know, during that span of time, there hadn't been any change. So I think from the public's point of view, maybe it could have gone one way or the other, but the details show otherwise. Mm -hmm. I think the Board of Trustees' old criteria for hiring a president for Gallaudet University, when you look at it, uh, was really a minor point whether the person knew sign language or not. If they didn't know sign language, it was felt, well, fine, you hire them and they'll be expected to learn within a year. And whether they had experience or prior background in deafness, that was never a criteria before. I think now you'll see that added and that uh, background in deafness, uh, knowledge of deafness and signing skills will become much more important. Also at that time, we argued that no matter if we saw that a person was qualified or not, we felt they'd always be hiring a hearing president for the university because often they'd have a uh, richer experiences. They've had different uh, job opportunities at different colleges, different universities, or opportunities in large companies and corporations, whereas a deaf applicant might not have similar opportunities and their resume couldn't really stack up against a hearing applicant. So we felt that we needed to start someplace with that opportunity for advancement and upward mobility, and that a deaf in applicant should have a better chance at Gallaudet, say, than any other university. So the feeling built that we really needed to be willing to hire a deaf president. I would like to continue this discussion. Oh, I'd like to ask you about what you think is next. Um, do you think that Gallaudet will be having a lot more improvements? We'll be right back to discuss that issue.
We're continuing with our topic, the Gallaudet protest, one year later. We've just, just been discussing uh, the choice of, of I. King Jordan as the president of Gallaudet, and wonder if the morale at, at Gallaudet University has changed since then. As an outsider on this, looking in, I think that the outlook there is much more positive. We have a deaf president, and there's hope now. One thing that I found really interesting, a fellow is doing a research study and has developed some statistics that are quite shocking. The expectations from people at Gallaudet are very high right now. One statistic showed that the expectation to have some like, something like 80 to 90 percent of deaf people at Gallaudet, working at Gallaudet to be deaf. So I don't know if that's going to happen in reality, but that's the expectation. Compared to the expectation prior to what has happened, I mean, people I think felt at that time, hurry up, we should move on with this. So I think the expectations are much better at this point. Yes, I think uh, you can see the inspiration that has happened and how deaf people have been inspired. I think the students around campus take much more pride in themselves. Maybe they're walking lighter than before. Uh, you can just see that. Is, you think the key word is pride? Pride, yes. And also, if you go to the Kendall school, school, where you see the children there, they have entirely different goals and aspirations than they had before. You talk to them, they say, oh, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer. Their goals seem a lot loftier than they did before, and that's really had an important impact on young deaf people. Not just us, but mm -hmm. the younger deaf people. I'd like to open comments and questions to the studio audience now. Now that we've witnessed a, a deaf president here at Gallaudet, I'm wondering what type of changes we'll notice occurring out in the community. Is, is this a shot in the dark? Is it a one-time one event or what? Okay, you can't expect things to happen that fast. Things just don't happen overnight. But. I think we will see a few changes that have been made at Gallaudet. Certainly there's a lot more publicity all over the place. Even when we were out in New Zealand at the World Games, uh, you could see differing priorities. And last year, Gallaudet got a sufficient increase in their funds. I think it was 6.2% increase from Congress. And Next year, we're expecting to get a similar increase in funds. When Gallaudet goes to Congress for budget hearings and asks for appropriations, uh, almost all of the congressmen wanted to attend that session and see President Jordan presenting. And as he left, you could see a lot of people were really interested in seeing what he had to say. So mm -hmm. uh, King Jordan was perhaps a celebrity. And I think the Congress feels that it's really cost-effective in some ways for what they invest in Gallaudet. Certainly there's time and money and energy spent on Gallaudet, but they're seeing the positive impact on how it can promote success mm -hmm. for deaf people in this country. That's true. So there's a lot of good things that are happening, good spin-off. For example, the Telephone Relay Service, uh, the Federal Telephone Relay Service Act that was passed last fall. NAD, the National Association of the Deaf, was certainly involved in that uh, effort, and Telecommunications for the Deaf Incorporated, the TTD group, was involved with that. Uh, Congressman McLean and several other legislators, oh, Senator McLean, was really helpful. I think there were three or four key people, Tom Harkins and uh, Congressman Gordon and several other of our legislators were really involved in that. Uh, the American Americans with Disabilities Act that's moving through Capitol Hill and uh, that was passed is going to have an impact on people all over. Fred could speak to that a lot better than I could. Yes, do you know about the ADA? I'd like to get back to her this woman's question. I think 
you know, Gallaudet has made its impact and the world has seen what has happened. And I think at this point we have to depend on ourselves to get what we want. Through the protests and what's happened over the past year, I see a variety of different barriers to people that we create ourselves. I mean, really, the, the attitudes that we have about ourselves, how we perceive ourselves, are often the biggest barriers. We need to put some analysis into understanding this perspective. One thing that's, that's been bothering me ever since this started, they developed this quiz at Gallaudet to ask people, an IQ test, to ask people, uh, why do some deaf, one of the question was, why do deaf, some deaf people have poor English skills? And they had a, quite a discussion about it. There's a variety of different answers, but another response to this, I mean, does anyone dare ask the question? Well, you know, people say, well, you know, deaf people's first language is ASL, and their educational abilities aren't that great, and, but nobody says, why is it that, hearing that some hearing people have poor English skills, poor American Sign Language skills? <laughs> so, I mean, it's the same, it's, it's a question of framing the question, not so much what the question is itself. That's exactly true, yes. We have more comments? I'd like to know if the number of students enrolled at Gallaudet is higher this year. Yes, applications are definitely up. Uh, you know, there's the application process that builds during the year. It starts around November or October in the fall. And around March or April, it's announced who's accepted. Uh, so that happened before the protest last year. But the trend is that applications are up, and they're expecting a lot more students. Yes, I was reading that 50 percent, there was a 50 uh, percent increase in enrollment for the prep um, year and freshman year, that 50 percent increase in new students. We were just talking about the ADA, which is the American People Yes, with the American Di with Disabilities Act. Okay. Uh, related to that, ADA. Uh, we were talking about the money that would be do, um, focused for research um, to try to cure deafness. Is that really what we want the money spent for? What do you think? Do you, yes? Boy, that's a really difficult question to respond to. Uh, if people ask me that, you know, a child's born, and, you know, sometimes they'll ask me, would I rather have my own children be born deaf or hearing? And, you know, in some ways it feels natural to say perhaps uh, it's natural if they're born hearing that, uh, that that's God's will or you expect children to be born hearing, not deaf. And, you know, when you talk about uh, a medical model and a cure for deafness, I think what's important is that individuals be content and happy. I think one of the forces behind ADA, ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, is to say that these are people with disabilities, and it's just a way of life having this disability, and these people learn to accept it. Yes. When you look into the deafness and you do some analysis, we, think, we sometimes think that we are the only group of people that have okay. a disability, and it's not true. I mean, there are... Mm -hmm. It's a profound impact on our psychological <laughs> makeup when we make these suppositions about ourselves. People who put in money to research, I mean, today want to know what the needs are. One man explained to me about it saying that the, talking about the medical model in uh, what exactly is going on with the ear and, and different kinds of modifications that can be made. And then we ask the question, don't forget also that the ear, that there's something in between the ears. And the response is, well, yeah, we're researching the brain too. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm really wondering what's going to happen 50 years up the road. Uh, will we see the population expanding or growing smaller? Because often, I think when hearing parents discover they have a deaf child 
and their child's born death, often the medical community uh, suggests to the parents, your child can become hearing or can be raised as a hearing child. And I think, you know, often we may see the population, the deaf population, really shrinking. I, I don't know. I'm just curious where we'll see things going. Interesting. So the last of the Mohicans, eh? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Do we have any other comments or questions? I recently was reading the uh, Gallaudet Alumni Newsletter, I believe, mm -hmm. and the suggestion was made to call Gallaudet, to rename it the Gallaudet and Cleric University. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you think of this idea. <laughs> I see, in some ways, no reason to distract this. Uh, to remove Claret from his position in history. Gallaudet was there too, so I support the idea. I think it would be a wonderful thing to include Claire in the name. I don't think it should really is a debatable point. The board should just, you know, decide it in the first few minutes of their first meeting. Yes, I agree. I remember that very well that when I was a freshman and arrived at school, it was Gallaudet College. Then I got to be a junior and it became Gallaudet University. And a lot of the students were really shocked. It just sounded <coughs> odd, Gallaudet University. You know, we were accustomed to Gallaudet College. And there were some negative attitudes about the name change from college to university. But now people are really used to it. And Gallaudet University sounds just natural. Uh, some people say, you know, why, why change the name to Gallaudet and Claire? Just leave it like it is. I think people are afraid of change, you know? But... I'm sure it'll become acceptable with the name as Gallaudet and Clare University. One worry that I have is the <laughs> letters, you know, I mean, and now it's Gallaudet <laughs> University. It could be GCU or whatever, you know. Sure, they fit William and Mary on the letterhead, too, so. Yes, it could be it'll considered fit. classy. <laughs> well, don't go away. We'll be right back with more discussion. We're continuing now with Greg and Fred. We're talking about Gallaudet, the protest, and now one year later. I was wondering at this point, uh, has the academic... King Jordan became president of Gallaudet. Has uh, King Jordan's presidency changed the academic status of Gallaudet? The standards become stricter. I think, you know, as I went from my freshman to my senior year, I've seen perhaps some 
academic problems, and they've certainly focused more on academic programs. But I don't think the standards have changed really at all. I think the standards are the same. I understand that the academic standards have been increased, and people are complaining at this point, uh, saying that they're much too strict. Uh, how do you feel about that? I don't feel the academic standards have been raised since I arrived on campus. I don't know, Fred, have you noticed anything? Or uh, I'm out of it. Uh, I do think that with the increase in applications, that there's a better selection of students available mm -hmm. for enrollment. Should we perhaps give students more opportunity, give more opportunity to deaf students to make Gallaudet University tougher, maybe like an Ivy League college. Uh, it's the only liberal arts school for the deaf in the world, so maybe we should expand our expectations a bit. If you increase the standards, it might become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, um, I would like to talk more about King Jordan. The deaf community, are they satisfied with that? with King Jordan being selected. There was another deaf candidate and um, I was... That person Harvey was Corson. Harvey Corson. And people, some people asked, why didn't you pick Harvey? Uh, and have you noticed that people are satisfied with, this, with King Jordan as being the selected president? I think it was absolutely the right choice. You know, you can't please everyone, that's for sure. And maybe if Corson were selected, people would be complaining now, well, how come King Jordan wasn't selected? Uh, he's worked there for a long time. He was really very popular with the faculty, got along well with the faculty. And the Board of Trustees thought it would be easier to have an internal applicant, perhaps, than bringing in someone from the outside uh, who might make some, perhaps, unrealistic changes or feel compelled to make some big changes real quick. And he was a deaf applicant. In addition to what he said, after the protest and everything happened, one of the first meetings that we had of the DPN committee, the Deaf President Now committee, we were discussing strategy and how we might move ahead in our first meetings and planning the protest. And what the question came up, who should we support? And the decision was mm -hmm. all deaf candidates. We are in no position to figure out which one we should support at this time. And therefore we would cause factions, polarization within our own group. So the thought was at that time that they'll pick the best, but we should support all the deaf candidates. There was Jordan, uh, Zinzer and Corson. So any of the three would be qualified, but we wanted to support the deaf candidates. Okay, yes, Alan. I'd like to ask a question about the Gallaudet Board of Trustees. What was their perception of what is going on now? since the demand to have 51% of the board be comprised of deaf people. Mm -hmm. I wonder how that will impact on the future. Good question. That was the third of the four demands, and really it hasn't yet been met, but the chairperson of the Board of Trustees has made a commitment to us, uh, a promise to us that they will try and do that. They have set up a search committee to seek out qualified deaf people from all over the United States to become members of the Board of Trustees. And on the Board of Trustees committees, they've uh, selected two deaf students from, for each committee. And I think, let's see, there's academic committee and a psychological committee, perhaps a faculty committee, but there's different working groups on the board. And there is a search on right now to nominate people for the for the Board of Trustees, so perhaps next year, but certainly through the future, we'll see some movement on that. Okay, thank you. Did that answer your question? Good, fine. I have a concern. Before, 
Gallaudet strongly emphasized the use of signing English within the classroom. I'm wondering if we'll make the uh, transition to using American Sign Language in the classroom. I'm glad you asked me that question because right after the protest, the language issue did come up. And language seems to be a hot issue right now. I know that there's a few panels discussing ASL, American Sign Language, and the students have set up a committee uh, that Gallaudet should recognize ASL as a language. I think one of the problems is that the faculty, as we're working with the faculty staff, it takes time to iron things out. But many of the students at Gallaudet are really eager to get heavily involved in the whole language issue question right now. Uh, Gallaudet has been establishing a deaf studies and deaf culture course, and that will be required for all students who enter the university, that they have to study mandatory study of a deaf culture or uh, deaf studies course. And there's a parallel at some of the black universities where they need to study uh, black culture, for example, at Howard University. Now, many of the deaf students who come from the mainstream have no knowledge of deaf culture and perhaps don't have that shared identity as a deaf person. So with that study about deaf culture and deaf heritage, they'll incorporate some discussion about language issues and sign language, American sign language. Ultimately, that'll put more pressure on Gallaudet as a university to recognize American sign language. Now, some of the student body that is oral, the oral students, are opposed to that idea, but there is discussion going on, and as long as we're focusing on language issues, it's felt that Gallaudet should recognize American Sign Language as a language, just as it recognizes other languages. Good. Thank you. Yes, there's a question over here. I know now it's one year since the protest, and I wonder what your future goals may be that you're interested in working on. Um, is the spirit going to die away with this particular event? Uh, could I clarify that? You mean uh, wanting the protest again? Uh... Well, now that we've accomplished this issue, I'm wondering whether people will feel satisfied with this or will they want to protest forever? Um, where does it end? I'm wondering what you think about that. Well, each situation is always different and you need to look at a specific situation. At that time when the Gallaudet rally occurred and the protest occurred, it was necessary. For other situations and goals, perhaps we can achieve what we want without having any sort of protest at all. Maybe there's other ways to work around the obstacles. And we certainly don't want to abuse that vehicle of a protest. Uh, you know, maybe it becomes a power issue. Yes, In Brian? addition to that, if the situation is right, the time is right for, the protest, for a protest, then we should use that. I mean, you need to have the right tool to say the right message. Another example is in the legislation of uh, serving deaf people, there's there's a, quite a struggle between the services for deaf people and the services for blind people. So they should, set up, should they set up two separate service centers? And there was a protest about that. And it's sort of become an old hat. You know, seeing people in the streets is becoming the, the, norm, the norm now. Uh, when you're talking about demonst uh, we we just had a demonstration in Albany. Um, we're concerned about the New York State budgeting yes, for schools for the yes. deaf. That's an example of another protest that happened recently. I'd like to add to that, as I was saying, I think we shouldn't always consider protesting first, and deaf people have maybe asked the world to, wait a minute, we can take care of ourselves, and we can be ourselves. We can control our own destiny. That means at this point it's our responsibility to work out our own way of accomplishing things too. We can't afford to sit back. Uh, let something go wrong and then be reactive and have a protest in response to what's gone awry. We s clearly need more deaf professionals, we need more deaf teachers, more deaf administrators uh, related to the schools. We need more deaf professionals of all varieties. 
and that'll make it easier to accomplish what we need to in the future. We need to encourage young deaf people to study for advanced degrees. And we also need to take, out, take advantage of the opportunities, like at Gallaudet, to give students the opportunity, you know, not only at in, uh, schools for the deaf, but also in other places for people to study about deafnesses, to learn about services and organizations. I learned all that I've learned about deafness through joining in and, you know, working by the seat of my pants in these different organizations. It took me a long time, and I bumped into a lot of walls trying to figure all this stuff out. So, you know, for example, grant, grant writing. How should you lobby properly? What does uh, public law or section 504 of the Rehabilitation Code really mean? A lot of these issues that I learned by the seat of my pants. ASL and what that's all about. I mean, the evidence that it's a language. What is it? Where is it? You know, how do we know that? Those kinds of things should be taught and should be studied by students so that deaf people are prepared to move on and they know what their heritage is about. Yes, thank you. And here's another question. I seem to be asking a lot of questions today, excuse me, but what is the best advice that you have to offer from your past positive experiences? How can you help us for the future? Hmm. As I said before, it really depends on the situation. For example, at NTID, whoever applies next to be the director there, uh, perhaps you'll have a, a list of 30 hearing applicants and they may or may not be sufficiently qualified. So it really depends on the entire situation and you need to weigh it carefully. But for me, I, I don't see why a deaf person should be president of, Gala, of NTID. I mean, if you have the feeling and it seems to be right that that person is qualified, then you should push it. But you should see who the deaf applicants are. You know, are deaf people actually even putting in their applications? I mean, I don't think there's a need to push deaf people into positions like that if they're not ready and qualified for it. Also, I think deaf people need to work up to what they're capable of doing. You need to get the word out in the first place to make sure you have plenty of qualified deaf applicants. It's up to the deaf community, too. Not someone who wants to be self-serving, but uh, it's a deaf community issue. Thank you. Okay, um, before we take this question, um, we'll have to do that for the next segment. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We're continuing with more on the Gallaudet protest one year later. We've been discussing in the last few segments about uh, King Jordan as being selected as the president, and I would like to discuss the criticism that he's received. Um, he said that, of course, he supports deaf people being hired into higher positions at Gallaudet, but if it so happens that there's two applicants a hearing person who is more qualified than a deaf person, then he would, of course, hire the hearing person. And some people are very upset with that statement. Um, do you have comments about it? More to the point, he said that he will select the best person for the job. So I don't think that we need to jump to the conclusion that in order to be best for the job, you need, you, you know, you're better qualified because you're deaf. The question is whether or not you're comparing the issues of qualifications 
you know, when you when you compare people just on the, you know, if you have somebody that's going to blow the doors off another candidate and the poor candidate is deaf, it's just not going to work. You shouldn't be picking the deaf candidate. I don't think we should interpret this to mean otherwise. We're trying to interpret this to we're going to pick the best person who's qualified for the job. I think we have to also look at the entire picture and find out what are all the qualifications we should look at. So I think that comment mm -hmm. really backs up that statement. Yes, the best person. All right, here's another question from our studio audience. I know very many memorable events happened at the Gallaudet protest, but I'm wondering if you experienced any embarrassing moments during that <laughs> event. I don't know if the right word is embarrassment, but uh, what I saw during the protest, well, there was sort of one moment that was sort of embarrassing, but anyways. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when there was all the commotion and all the people in the environment and it seemed like us versus them and when we looked at ourselves we really found that uh, in some ways there was a lot of polarization and a lot of disagreement within our own group but we worked so well together I mean we, we became very blunt and straight with each other and worked it out we worked very well towards the point the goal that we had for Friday it was a lot of work in one week. I mean, there was no experience like it. I mean, there were times when people lost their temper and just, like, it seemed like no reason. And it would be embarrassing at that moment. You'd get all red in the face and you'd go home, get some rest, and, and think about it. And the next morning, you'd be fine. You'd come back, apologize, and you'd get back to the task. So I think that's the true nature of people, to respond that way in, in <laughs> mm -hmm. pressureful situations. Oh, boy, an embarrassing moment. I don't know if it's specifically embarrassing, but I remember one time we were in Chapel Hall at Gallaudet and there was a press conference going on and I just felt like saying, you know, just letting loose. I, I wanted to sign stronger and as they snapped a photograph of me where my hands were and my, uh, the hand position and my body movement, uh, there was a picture from old Jim <laughs> Uh, and they they put up a picture in old Jim, and they they drew a gun in my hand. So that was kind of embarrassing. I'd like to ask Fred. With your work in the NAD office, do you think that there's been any improvement since this movement? A good question. I work in Washington, D.C. I don't have a whole lot of contact in the external community, but from what I do here, yeah, things are looking up. In the Washington, D.C. area, the people on Capitol Hill, the senators, they're very motivated to work with deaf people now. They're willing to listen and to, to, they're curious about issues regarding deaf people, as well as other disabilities. So, you know, it's not, it's, you can't say that there's been a 100% improvement or anything, but it's, in Washington, D.C. and in the Capital District area, there has been quite a lot more attention and much more motivation. You said you can't speak for the rest of the country, but the NAD is a national organization, so it should speak for the rest of the country. Well, I'm speaking from what I've seen, the improvements that I've noticed. I'm, my position does not offer me the opportunity to work with other state directors in the NAD, mm -hmm. but from my, what I've witnessed, that's really all I can speak to. I see. Okay. Yes, Mark? Well, in the past 124-year history, there's never been a deaf president until last year. And I would think that that would influence other big companies to uh, lower their amounts of discrimination that we've witnessed. Um, do you think that this will uh, affect the rest of the country? Hmm. I know at one stage during the protest, uh, there was a job interview. And I think perhaps people were being hired. I'm not sure if the protest had a, a, a real impact on individuals like that, but people did tell us thanks and they thought that uh, they had a greater opportunity for promotion on the job, a greater chance of upward mobility because upper administration saw what was possible and that there will be that sort of impact over the next 10, 15 yes, years. We'll just have so to wait good. and see. That's, 
very important impact. In many ways, it's still early, it's still early to tell what the final effect of this is going to be. If uh, this becomes an epic of what's happened at Gallaudet University, it truly is an indication that there will be more offers from companies and more internships and more opportunities at some mm -hmm. of the bigger companies. Mm -hmm. But it's really too new, too early to tell. Yes. I wonder what your best experience during the protest was. Ooh, my best memory. Uh, hmm. Yeah, um, as I look back, there was this one evening where I was pretty restless, and even on Sunday, we, we felt like backing out of the whole thing. The board was being intransigent, and uh, they didn't want to have a deaf president. They'd already picked Zinzer, and we were pretty shocked. We couldn't believe this. We felt maybe we couldn't even do a protest. They already picked the president. What can we do about it now? And they told us to stop, you know? And we thought about this, and we got a call from Phil Braven, and he had a copy of the conversation. And they said, go for it. And we heard that, oh, you know, over the four days that they Zinzer had resigned, and we were all just so happy and so jubilant that, this, that we'd succeeded. It was just inspiring. Yeah, just a big party at Old Jim with everyone on the tables just jumping up and down on the tables and dancing and just the inspiration. Never forget it. Uh, that was one of the best moments, and I think the other is, you know, like Fred was saying, but the other was uh, on Nightline that evening when I had the chance to appear. I was so nervous, and, you know, it was just preying on my mind all day long until about 10, we met in front of Gallaudet, and there was just this huge limo to bring us over to the TV studio, and we got in, and I was really worried, because I knew it was uh, a nationwide broadcast, and felt, you know, I, I was the one spokesperson they'd selected. <coughs> and I thought, whatever I say is gonna reflect on deaf people all over the country, all over the world. And that sort of attention was just nerve-wracking. Uh, it was... I, I didn't know if I'd be the hero or the goat, uh, you know? And I knew there'd be champagne and wine and beer. It was there in the limo. I was just so tempted to have a drink and relax. But, you know, so I just had a, a, a little sip of beer. And I felt a bit better when we got there to do the filming for Nightlife, the videotaping. And boy, it felt like it was over in a minute. It, it just felt like it went that quickly. You know, that whole week and then that night and the, the, the celebration and just the feeling of confidence after that point from that night on. You know, I got into bed, I couldn't sleep. I was just up all night. I was so wired. And I guess that was really one of my best moments. Another memory is the reporters. They just seemed to be everywhere. Prior to this, we had reporters, you know, and we just, if a reporter came by, we'd drop anything to do, do have an interview with them. And by the end of the week, we were sick of these people, you know. Hey, we're too busy. Leave us alone. Come back later, you know. <laughs> and after the protest was over, now, same thing. If a reporter stops by, you know, we drop everything all over again for him. So. Uh-huh. It was similar for <laughs> me, too. It depends, really. D d depends on, you know, who the reporters were, if they'd been there before, if they'd been out to the university, or if they were from a really small newspaper. You know, during the week, uh, we'd, we'd see the action news reporters, and they'd give us an interview. And, you know, there was a tendency almost to ignore uh, reporters from some of the smaller papers and Didn't you turn down, uh, I was picking surprised. out the best reporters. You turned out an interview with Brokaw, right? Turned down or an your interview agent with Tom Brokaw? On, I mean, I heard that. You turned out an interview with Brokaw. I thought that was pretty amazing that you would turn him down. Huh? Boy, don't tell me that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, right now, you've been involved so so deeply in all of this action. I was wondering, you, you speak all over the country. How has your personal life been affected by all of your act, your involvement in this protest? Um, how have how has your personal life changed? Well, in some ways, it hasn't been easy on me because, you know, I'm still a student. It's not like I'm an adult out in the world yet. 
Uh, we have some intramural softball games, and I wish I were back at school playing with my team. But I, I do get called on to travel a lot and speak to groups. And, uh, you know, if people ask me to do a presentation, I always accept. I always try and uh, make sure I can juggle my schedule to be able to respond and be responsive. In some ways, it's affected my studies a little. It's hard to keep up in school. Uh, but I've had to change my schedule and sometimes, you know, school comes first. So sometimes I'll have to ask people to change their schedules a bit. But, you know, at my age, this has been a wonderful experience and I've learned a lot of time management skills. Thank you for taking your time to come here. I, we really appreciate it. And I've enjoyed it too. We have just a short time left. Does anyone have a last comment or question? Yes, Kathy? I have to bring up the uh, issue of attitude. It seems that we have a lot of segmented groups in the deaf community, the oral group, the very manual group, and I, I'd like to see that unity continue. I, I don't want to see a dispersion of, of efforts. And I'm wondering what you think about that. We're talking about the unification of all deaf people. Yes, thank you for coming. It's been wonderful having you here. This has been a great discussion. We'll be right back. Thank you very much, Greg, and thank you, Fred. We've really enjoyed this discussion, been very inspired by the entire Gallaudet protest. Thank you very much.